There are already so many big men fighting this war. Maybe what we need now is a little guy. Huh? Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film. We explore its themes, the history, the filmmaking, and the influence it has on us today. My name is Steve Morris. I am a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roke. I'm a writer, producer, and host here in San Diego, California, uh, and a voiceover artist and a massive Captain America fan. So I'm at least the film. And so I'm very excited to be jumping into this uh, film today with you, Steve, and our special guest. Yes, because I am a massive Captain America fan, too. But I am also a massive fan of actor, writer and geek buddy Shannon McClung. Welcome back to the Cinephiles. Gentlemen, thank you so much. I was so excited when you all asked if I would uh, if I would be a part of this because uh at, you know, I have a I had a very special way that I saw this movie that I imagine we'll get to talk we'll get to talk about in just a second. But also, real quick before we jump in, I just wanted to say I was listening to Ocean's 11 Part 1. Mm-hmm. Um which as always, fantastic job. You you guys know I love love your show. Uh the comparison to Eddie Jimison, <laughs> the Livingston Dell that John brought up. Fun story. I have auditioned for many a role with with uh, Eddie Jemison and <laughs> have have yet to get it. It <laughs> either either he gets it or someone else gets it, but I do not get it. Um, and also my favorite part because I was like, oh, that's fun. I like you know that's nice to be mentioned. My favorite part of that show was John Roca's utter <laughs> exasperation at the suggestion that Mike Vogel would be Danny Ocean. If I could clip that out, that. <laughs> oh, why and turn that into a cell phone ring i 100 percent would i have no further comment on, on that but it was it was a fine moment and multiple people i believe have commented on it please he's the rusty and he knows it i'm the idiot that would try to rob three casinos for a woman please <laughs> that, that i'm just happy he's to a be great small. he's a great organizer don't get me wrong but yeah, he, he is very good at planning things. So. Yes, <laughs> um, but this is not the Ocean's Eleven Mike Vogel podcast. This is, in fact, the Captain America, the first Avenger podcast. And it is our very first since Iron Man of the MCU that we're giving the full cinephiles treatment. And I think this movie absolutely deserves it. Agreed. Agreed. This is one of the, I was saying to this in our preview for the show and recorded it. Um, I think this is the actual beginning of the MCU in my mind, like Iron Man, Hulk, those are kind of the preparatory Thor, Thor. It's kind of getting the, the pieces in place, but this is where I think it starts to expand because of the Tesseract, because of red skull, because of the time jump, because of everything involved in it. And so I've always kind of unofficially in my mind, felt that it was the start of the MCU. You know what? I actually agree with you, John, because everyone, uh, it's a popular theory that the MCU does not exist the way we know it without the casting of Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark, which there's a lot of, there's a lot out there that supports that. But I think maybe if not as important, but just slightly below is the casting of Chris Evans as Captain America. I mean, one, looking at what his filmography was prior to, prior to him being Cap, Um, But also, you know, you discovered that this wisecracking actor has just this this soulful depth with his portrayal of Steve Rogers. I don't think the MCU works out as well as it does without Chris Evans as Captain America. Yeah, Steve, and this is something we've talked about on the show before when it comes to casting. Certainly, you know, with uh, being married to Karen, you're very acutely aware of casting and the importance of it. I mean, these are casting coups that you cannot deny, Steve, right? I mean, Robert Downey Jr. coming out of really kind of untouchable at the, around that point, just slowly working his way back in to the public consciousness and insurance companies taking a chance on him a little bit. And then Chris Evans, who wasn't really known as a lead of anything. He'd been in Not Another Teen Movie, for God's sakes, and Scott Pilgrim, which had crashed and bombed. So like this casting of him, um, of both of these guys, but especially Chris Evans here, was such a fantastic job by them, right? Well, and it really is the heart of the of the first many phases of the MCU, the Captain America Iron Man conflict and their different worldviews. That's that's the central core going through these movies. And I'll I'll say another thing, too. I totally agree, too, that this is the beginning of the MCU. Mm. The other ones are kind of individual movies where they kind of had tiny, tiny little bits of connection. I think the choice to call it Captain America, 
the first Avenger right. makes it the there's that's a weird title. There is <laughs> the only reason I think to have that title is to say this is the beginning of this thing, yeah. and the Avengers are going to be a big part of it. Yeah, especially like, when you consider Captain Marvel is actually officially the, the first Avenger in in terms of creating the Avengers themselves with the Avengers Initiative. Uh, but Captain America, mm. of course, being older than her, uh, yes. kind of qualifies more so. Um, you guys have hinted at it, but I don't know the story. How, Shannon, did you first come to this film? Okay, so this would have started in Comic-Con 2010. So this was yes. a year before Captain America came out. John and I had a tradition um, that we would be in Hall H all day on Saturday, which um, it is always so much fun and it's a blast, but it's also a Herculean effort oh <laughs> because if the panels start at 10 or 11, at the time we were probably getting in line around six in the morning, maybe, yeah. maybe before. Um, Hall H in the San Diego uh, Convention Center holds about 6,500, 7,000 people. And you would be shocked at how quickly the line to get in to Hall H would form. Now they've developed systems with wristbands and you show up at a certain point the night before. Um, at the time, like they didn't have that. So John and I got to the convention center to get in line around 6 a.m. Marvel, because it was still, even then, it was it was the, how they closed out the show. You know, you have to get through panel after panel after panel, like seven, eight hours of panels yes. to get to to get to Marvel. And this was their first big year because this is where they brought out Kenneth Branagh and Chris Hemsworth. Um, I, and I can't remember. I think that's the year that they introduced the Avengers cast. That's where Jeremy Renner was introduced, mm -hmm. was introduced as Clint Barton and was uh, uh, Mark Ruffalo was introduced as Bruce Banner. But in between, they brought out Joe Johnston, Chris Evans and Hugo Weaving. And uh, they had only been shooting for a few weeks at that point. And they had actually cut together a little bit of footage and... It was, I think, it was uh, the scene at the beginning where um, Hydra comes into Norway. Like that's that mm -hmm. was the scene that they showed us. But as Chris Evans walks out on stage, I mean, one, the guy's he's a movie star, but also he's always been in good shape. He was huge. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there are giant screens all over the convention center because again, it's it's seven thousand people. Um, so there's giant screens and you could see the buttons on his shirt were struggling to stay attached <laughs> because the dude was so yoked. Um, but then flash forward a year later for comic con, they were having screenings of captain America and me and my, me and my buddy, John Roca, we <laughs> got to attend one of those screenings and that was one of the best like we talk about great comic con experiences and certainly Scott Pilgrim versus the world. That screening is, is way up there. Legendary Steve. You should have been there. It was so <laughs> Just the greatest. <laughs> It'll never end. <laughs> but John and I, during the day, I can't, I don't remember what day it was, but it yeah. was during the day, but so we got Friday to go, Saturday. we got to go and see Captain America. And that was just, that was just one of the best times. I mean, the fact that the fact that the movie turned out as well as it did and just getting to see it with one of my closest friends. I mean, it was it was awesome. It was so great. Yeah, and it was great because we – it was at a mall somewhere. We had gotten some kind of flyer. And so we were still not familiar where this – so we had to kind of navigate and figure out where the mall was. And this is 2010, so Waze is not the thing in 2010. You're just kind of asking people and figuring it out. And we took a chance, walked over there, and we thought we were going to be late and not have a good seat. We walked in. There was maybe 15 to 20 people in the theater. There were not that many people in the theater. So this is before Marvel is Marvel. And so we went in there. We got to sit near the back comfortably uh, in a couple of seats and watch this thing. And both of us were just absolutely mystified at how well they got this right, how fantastic they were in creating this, essentially the Marvel Superman uh, and doing it so well when we'd heard over and over again how Superman can't be done now. Nobody wants a goody two-shoes character. Nobody wants this or that. And you saw that they were able to do it. The sweetness, the heart, the vulnerability, the honesty throughout the film, and the first great love story in the MCU. You can take your Pepper Potts and Stark and go somewhere else with that. Peggy <laughs> Carter and uh, and uh, Steve Rogers is the first real romance of the MCU, and I would argue still the greatest uh, in the MCU. And this uh, film showed you why you know I, I i agree with all of that and for me this is where so this is 2011 which is the mm -hmm. year my son was born 
And this begins the long journey of me not seeing movies in the movie theater. <laughs> it was a long time before I was able to get back and actually start seeing movies in the theater. So this was one I rented, you know, nine months later or mm. something. Whenever it came out on on digital, that's when I got it. Um, and But had the same experience of just like, wow, they they get it. They figured out how to do this thing. And And I think the argument, that Superman argument of, no, we can't have someone that's not dark is such bullshit. Like... And, th- and this movie really proves why. I wanted to give a bit of backstory on actual Captain America, who was created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. Uh, and I just have to say, this is, you know, maybe it's just a piece of Jewish pride, but like <laughs> all of the guys that created all of these great heroes, the vast majority of them are ki- children of Jewish immigrants, you know? Yeah. yeah. A- and I think there is a real connection there. Uh, there's that great book, uh, Cavalier and Clay, by uh his name just totally went out of my brain. Uh, but anyway, uh, Michael Chabon. Yeah. And that really tells the story of Jewish immigrants and relates to the comic book world. And I think there is this connection of these people whose family escaped horribleness in Europe that create this bunch of heroes, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was originally titled Super American. That's what they wanted to call him. And Joe Simon went, there's too many supers out there. Switched it to Captain. Came out in March of 1941. Was a huge hit. And the way we can't even conceive of how many comics they used to sell back in the day. It's kind of, it's kind of crazy, Steve. Uh, March 1941. This is just what, like six, seven or eight, what, nine months before Pearl Harbor? So yeah. World War II is raging in Europe. We are not wanting to be a part of World War II. Roosevelt was determined to keep us out of that war unless we needed to go in there. And then, you know, Captain America comes out kind of symbolizing America and embracing that. And then the timing of it to have Pearl Harbor happen and have this fervor of patriotism nine months later, I think, uh, you know, indirectly, I'm sure, helped to elevate this character even more so and bring more of a seriousness approach to that character to make it symbolize America during a time of war. Absolutely. I think I think the well, and I think maybe it's that super patriotism that people like reacted against at a certain Mm. point, you know, because uh, Cap gets discontinued in 1950. They tried to bring him back in the mid 50s. And then finally, it's in the 60s at Marvel that they finally bring him back by Stan Lee. And we're going to see exactly kind of not exactly, but how they did that is part of this film. Yeah. And the other thing I want to bring up was there's a long history of trying to make this movie. There is a Captain America movie that's horrible from back in the 80s. 1990. 1990. 1990. I saw that movie. I saw the teaser poster for that movie in the movie theaters Um, because because those posters started to go up around the time Batman, the 1989's Batman was in the theaters. And it was just a simple shot of the shield and, you know, coming soon. And then, because I remember at the time, like 1989, I would have been 11. Mm-hmm. Um, I was so excited because there was actually, I want to say on like like an Entertainment Tonight show. Maybe it was Entertainment Tonight. But they had a behind the scenes of Captain America. Like you saw, I believe his name is Matt Salinger is the actor who played mm. it. They yes. had a little behind the scenes footage of like there was something on top of him. He's trying to push it off. And I was like, all right, Captain America coming soon. Says so right there on that poster in the movie <laughs> theater. And then you wait and you wait and you wait. And then it never comes. <laughs> and I remember one day being in like my local mom and pop uh, video store. And there was the po- there was the the VHS of this of this movie. And I remember looking at it, being like, "Huh, man, it looks a lot different than Michael Keaton and Batman." Uh, <laughs> all right, let's uh, let's rent it. And the movie is not great. Um, I, I don't think it's the cinematic pariah that it has been labeled. But even as you know, I would have been probably twelve or thirteen at the time. Even as a twelve or thirteen year old, I'm like. This is, not, this is not this isn't as good as batman but, <laughs> but i mean they made like uh, the red skull ended up being italian in it i think you know i won't say ned Beatty was in it I mean, of course it, it it was not the best movie and that was when <laughs> as a child you start to realize oh not everything that goes into the movie theaters is good well, and, and it's funny because this is such a weird era. This is when, by the way, I am working in a comic book store. I'm in college and I was there when 89 Batman came out and there was this huge boom in comics because people were buying like 15 different versions of the same comic in a sealed bag with different covers because yeah. everyone thought there was going to be all this money there. Oh, yeah. I remember and so, that. Yeah. And, and so for like a couple of years, these companies are making tons of mo- money and Marvel overextends itself, and it goes bankrupt in 1996. This is what people don't remember. 
Marvel was going to be gone. They were selling it for $25 million. If someone had bought it for $25 million when Stanley was trying to sell it, I mean, that's the greatest purchase you could ever make over a, over a sports team, over anything to have seen what the end result would have been. But you know, things happen for a reason. Uh, And I do want to throw one thing in here. Uh, Although I am the same age as Steve or around the same age as Steve, Shannon, we're a little older than you. I remember the 1979 Captain America movie with the great Red Brown, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the muscle-bound blonde Red Brown who uh, uh, played it. And that was my first experience with Captain America because that was right around the time Incredible Hulk, I think, was happening with Bill Bixby. So mm. that kind of uh, aligned, and there was a Thor in that Incredible Hulk. You, if you go back and see that episode with the long hair and the hammer and the whole nine, what that version of of uh, the superheroes were, we have come a long, long way. And real quick, Matt Salinger, one of the mean jocks in Revenge of the Nerds. So just oh. letting you know that he became Captain America out of that. Ah. Well, and it's something I, I had a vaguest memory of, but now I just went to Wikipedia and looked it up, is that Matt Salinger is, in fact, the son of reclusive author J.D. Salinger. Wow. How ironic for a man who, like... Road catcher and the rider of his son to represent Captain America. That is so interesting. On so it's many a lot. Levels. It's a lot. Um, but there's plans to make another Captain America in 1997 because Artisan Entertainment had the rights to a bunch of these Marvel movies. They would later on to go do the Thomas Jane Punisher film. And they're right. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, Thomas Jane Punisher, that is my first professional editing job doing a behind the scenes for that. Oh, wow. uh, uh, was that's my first and it's not even on the disc they did it as a test <laughs> I cut some Thomas Jane Punisher things um, but that's beside the point um, they were about to go into production and then a lawsuit comes along about who owns the rights to Captain America and that lawsuit is from Joe Simon who is still alive in the late 90s and the lawsuit delays the uh, production and was finally settled in 2003, at which point Paramount is now on board. And then the big thing that happens is that Merrill Lynch invests $525 million in Marvel to produce 10 films. Wow. Which I go, I have two big thoughts about this. One is horrible Captain America movie, horrible Punisher movie. Marvel's gone bankrupt. The idea of investing $525 million, it seems like good money after bad. Yeah, yeah. And the other thought is, wow, what a great investment that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you want to bash Merrill Lynch, go ahead. But we wouldn't have Marvel without it. So it's just yeah. kind of crazy to think about how these uh, tentacles are with And having seen these uh, shows recently, like We Crash, these other things, I mean, getting people to invest in your company is massive and not an easy thing to do. So clearly they must have seen something that must have been one incredible pitch in the room to get them to put that much money down for marvel well particularly because it didn't include their most popular characters Mm. because it didn't include the x books it didn't include Mm spider-man i mean i wouldn't have done it if you had said hey we're going to do millions of dollars worth of movies on iron man and hawkeye and i'd be like and thor cap i'd be like well that's stupid why would you do that yeah i don't remember which publication it was but when the announcement of what marvel was planning to do i want to say the headline was marvel rolls out the b team (sighs) yep well it was it (laughs) was yeah those books didn't sell no one was i mean people bought the avengers books they bought captain america books but the big money was spider-man and the x books yeah um, now it's like 2007, and who's coming on to direct Captain America? But John Favreau, hmm. and then wow. he sw- they switch and they go, "We're going to do Iron Man first instead." So he leaves the project. They bring on uh, Louis Letier, who did Incredible Hulk, and he's going to direct it. Oh God! And then final, and then in 2008, Joe Johnston sh- signs on. I think he's a perfect pick for this movie. Yes. Yeah. This this is this is the movie that I think he's always wanted to make. Like he got to make it with the Rocketeer to an extent. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think this is the movie that he has always wanted to make. And like I you know, I obviously I rewatched um First Avenger for this, and then I also put on Rocketeer and just um how I mean they are they are spiritual cousins. I mean, they're yeah. you know, I mean you see a lot of fan art where you will have the Rocketeer, Cliff Secord with a cap that really looks like Chris Evans next to Harrison Ford's Indiana Jones. I mean, you have three, three dudes who, you know, would have existed at the same time hanging out together on a t-shirt. I mean, it's one of the, it's one of the best designs. And yeah, I mean, I agree. I think Joe Johnston 
you know, you, you, you look at where Cap starts with his first movie and you watch his journey throughout the Marvel Cinematic Universe and where he had to start was with Joe Johnston. It's such a perfect choice. You're right, Steve, because he captures that, I don't know, what that magical, wide-eyed, ambling, Steven Spielberg, Americana approach to Captain America that I think is so essential to laying the groundwork for what we're going to get later. And yeah, of course, the Russo brothers do an excellent job with the um, following installments, but this is the right director at the right time for something like this, really getting you to embrace the... I don't know, the the innocence of Captain America, the underdog nature of Captain America, and the fact that he wants to stand and symbolize for what we uh, have always told ourselves or been told that uh, that are the best parts of America. And so just that kind of, um, I don't know, reimagining of this innocence of, uh, of uh, and purity of our values in this country, I think, was such a great approach from Joe Johnston. Um, and he directs those scenes of him connecting with people and being told no and overcoming it all when he becomes Captain America with just as much uh, tenderness and delicacy as he directs uh, those uh, terrible moments where he loses uh, Bucky and loses uh, uh, Peggy later on in the film. So it just works so well. And we still get the menace of Red Skull. I mean, I was rewatching it for the show this morning and I was like, man, he kills a lot. The Germans kill a lot of people. Old people die all over the first 20 minutes of the movie, male, female, it doesn't matter. So it isn't wide-eyed and bushy and and bushy-tailed. It it does let you see the darkness of the Nazi regime within this uh, um, haze of the Americana of the 1940s. Well, I think the pitting, part of what allows Captain America to be so hopeful and pure is that we start off with villains that are really, really villainous. There's not a lot of gray areas here. The other thing, by the way, the other reason film that I think is a film that people overlook uh, that is a Joe Johnston film that I think that innocence and that hope. Can I take a guess? Can I take a guess? Is it October sky? October sky is such a good movie. Uh, There were a lot of different versions of this script. It ended up being Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely who did it, but there was versions where the Submariner was in there. There was versions where it was much more in the modern day. There was all sorts of debate about how best to handle this. They finally started to lock it down. Uh, And then, Joss Whedon came in and did a final rewrite, which apparently a part of his deal to do the Avengers was he had the right to do a rewrite on Captain America. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I think I read uh, an interview with him where he was talking about it, that the story was really in place. Like it was a really, it was a really tight, well-told, well-paced story. He just wanted to have the opportunity to go in and do some character stuff. So the Steve that we meet in First Avenger is going to be the same guy as the Steve we meet in the Avengers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Well, I am sure we're going to talk a lot about Joss Whedon when we get to the Avengers, but <laughs> we don't have to get into that quite now. One, one other thing that happened in pre-production, by the way, is Marvel makes a big announcement that this movie is going to be shot in 3D. This is like peak 3D now. And Joe Johnson went and did a one day test with the 3D rig. And he said, this is terrible. It's a nightmare. We're shooting in 2D. You can convert it later. <laughs> and so it's a 2D. <laughs> um, shall we get into the film? Let's do it. Yes. Uh, we start with those iconic Marvel pages turning and we hear wind and snow and we're somewhere in the snow. At first I go, well, this is the South Pole or something, but of course it's actually the North Pole and we see headlights coming and guys working and it's so weird because after a few seconds you go, this is not in the past. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like this is modern day. I thought I was going to see a period piece. How long before we can start craning it out? I don't think you quite understand. Guys are gonna need one hell of a crate. Steve, you can't resist the um connections to Superman here, right? To Man of Steel. I mean, there's a ship stuck in the snow, mm. a guy out of time. Just it's just interesting, you know, right? When, when I was re-watching it this time, because obviously this is what, three years or five years ahead of Man of Steel. It's kind of interesting to see the projectile sticking out of the snow and mm. the guy's like you're gonna need a bigger crane that kind of thing which i love but we don't net we don't see these guys necessarily as like shield or anything like that um and then we have that moment where they see the actual shield and say wake up uh was it the senator or the chairman it's 3 no, a.m colonel. yeah i don't care oh colonel right i don't care yeah. it's 3 a.m wake him up you know because he's gonna want to see this this guy's been 
Um, it, this guy, well, whatever. It's been too long or whatever. This one's waited long enough. This one's waited yeah. long enough. Yeah, it, rewatching it, like I, I did have that same thought, John. Like, why, why wasn't this Phil Coulson? Like, why didn't they yeah. make Phil Coulson one of these guys who shows up? And it's like, well, whatever this crew was doing, you know, up in the North Pole, you know, there would have been no reason for Shield to get involved at this point because they're like, you know, whatever they're drilling for, you know, there was nothing out of the ordinary until they find this thing that's like, oh, this doesn't belong. So it would have gone up. It would have gone up sort of the chain of command and S.H.I.E.L.D. wouldn't necessarily have known about it, even though I thought it would have been a cool place to I see wish, Phil Coulson. I wish it was Coulson. And because they said these are guys from Washington. We know that a call went to Washington and some people came down. So I totally wish it was Coulson. But I also think this moment, particularly if you're a comic book fan and you know that Cap had been frozen in ice. There's this moment where I'm watching and I see there, that the guy has seen something and I go, oh, shit, I know what it is. Yeah. And that's the kind of fan service that I think is great. If you know something, you get an extra little thrill. And if you don't know something, it still all totally works. And then we go back to Tonsberg, Norway, 1942. Uh, this is apparently the first day of shooting. We're in some old castle kind of place. We yeah. hear gunfire. And they're sort of like, no, no, they'll never find it. And then the big wall completely collapses, crushing one of the guys. <laughs> And then among the world's coolest cars of all time pulls into the space. Shannon, my guess is you love that car. Uh, yes, there, you know, there was a script that I wrote with my old writing partner many years ago, which John and Steve have written. And when I think of what that like, because there's a I tried to put in an iconic automobile as well. When I think of that car. I, I look at the more heroic version of that car that Hugo Weaving is driving because it is just six wheels, exhaust pipes on the side of the engine. That is just the coolest design. It's it's the past with with a with a bend, um, yeah. which is something I think that Marvel does really well. It's taking the reality or the history that we know and putting a slight twist to it to make it kind of out of this world. Right, right. The car is 25 feet long. As you say, it has six wheels. It's designed by Daniel Simon, who designed all the vehicles in Tron Legacy, which hmm. regardless of what you think about that movie, John, I think you like it much more than I do. Yeah. It looks amazing. Oh, yeah. It is a gorgeous film. It's based on uh, the Mercedes 540K and the G4, which I had to go look up pictures wow. of these cars. These are some beautiful old cars. And we see some boots walking. And you, I mean, again, you give your bad guy a good entrance, and man, Johannes Schmidt, Hugo Weaving, the Red Skull has a great entrance here. Yeah, yeah you just he, you know, he's backlit. Like you see his subordinates out there trying to open this, you know, the sarcophagus. You know, you you can sense there's a lot of urgency. I mean, they're the ones that busted in. They're not afraid of the Tower Keeper, who was played by the great da David Bradley from who plays Mister Filch in the yeah. Harry Potter films. He's mm. also uh, Lord Greyjoy from Game of Thrones. They are not concerned about that old guy at all. They're concerned about the thing that's behind them. And then when you when you hear the entrance of Hugo Weaving and that turn and that that silhouette, that just class, he's got that long black leather coat, just this classic silhouette, uh, just fantastic. I think it's so funny the roles that Hugo Weaving has played. And there's sometimes I see him where you, you can kind of feel like he's getting a paycheck, you know? <laughs> I think he's his performance as Johann Schmidt is fantastic. Oh, yeah. Considering he is never going to do it again, he said, yep. and he hated wearing the makeup and the whole. He just kind of looked down on it. Never mind that he's the voice of um, in Transformers. Megatron. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, of Megatron. I mean, you know, judging a Marvel film is hilarious to me when you voice Megatron in five fucking movies. Um, but yeah, that kind of you see that kind of thing. It's a weird kind of disconnect in my mind uh, with how he has an issue with it because I mean. I, I love him as Red Skull and Shannon and you are right, Steve. It's a great intro. Him standing on the rubble backlit, mm -hmm. just kind of conveying what he wants to essentially stand on, which is the rubble of the world with him atop of it. It's a great intro. And then we hear what I think is a damn good accent. I, I like his German yeah. accent here as an, also as an Australian. I mean, I, I, I don't know what the mouth uh, um, gymnastics has to be to do a German accent when you have an Australian accent. And so it's just fascinating to watch. It. And I love the way he plays it, you know, the, the little moments that he has. And even the exchange with David Bradley when he's like, I think that you are a man of great vision. And in this way, we are much alike. I am nothing like you. No, of course, but what others see as superstition, you and I know to be a science. And usually you take that like, 
Well, he's saying, you know, um, uh, yeah, they have differences, but he's really saying from a place of the, yes, this is a matter of fact, not, I'm not judging you. It's just the truth because you're a human and I'm a superhuman. So these yeah. little kind of layers or little kind of moments when he's having these exchanges, you can tell he's done his normal great acting work to give you those uh, levels uh, in his performances and his back and forth with any of the characters in the film. Well, and you also get a sense, like, one, this is the second time that Joe Johnston has directed Hugo Weaving, because mm. this is, they, they work together on The Wolfman, which, mm. you know, The Wolfman, right. the way it turned out, you know, not everybody loved that movie, um, yeah, but yeah, Hugo yeah. Weaving's performance as that inspector, like, he was dynamite. Yes. Um, one of the rare times that he gets to play not a villain, and he was, he was great. But also, there is, from the moment, like, there is a charm to his Johann Schmidt. Yeah. But there's also, you can tell there is a lack of redemption. Like this is a black and white world. And this guy very much is the villain. And you also, I love too, that there's, they handle it in a subtle way that we'd seen these guys trying to pull this big stone lid off a sarcophagus or something. And then Hugo Weaving comes up and just pushes it off. And I think if you're not paying that much attention, you might just kind of go, wait, what? Is he strong? I don't get it. But if, of course, if you're a comic book fan, you go, ah, yeah. <laughs> and he reaches in and pulls out this box. The Tesseract was the jewel of Odin's treasure room. But the box, that doesn't look all that special. And he drops it and it shatters. It's not something one buries. <laughs> you know, this is the the old guy was the guy who said they're not going to find it. They never they've come before. They're never going to find it. Right. Johann Schmidt turns, looks at this kind of, you know, relief on the wall that has a snake, goes right to the eye, pushes it. And suddenly this wall opens and there he pulls out this box in terms of hiding places. Maybe don't hide the real one right next to the fake one. <laughs> <laughs> But also, I mean, of course, no one's been. And by the way, this is the oldest city in Norway. It's considered the oldest mm. city in Norway. I think it was in the ninth century. Um, so it's been around a long time. So that's a logical place to put the Tesseract. Plus, you're always connecting it to Thor, Norse mythology. Sure. All of that is there. But this idea that that the David Bradley's character has that no one's going to find it, it's because no human intellect has found it. But he's a superhuman. So his mind works at a whole other level. So naturally, he would be the one to figure this thing out uh, within you know a couple of minutes and where it might be. And it has shades of the uh, Last Crusade when he's like, oh, let me drink from the golden cup. Right. Like, this is the cup Jesus Christ would have. No, it's more of a carpenter's cup, right? And so this kind of moment is, works as well in that, oh, no, this is all fake. You think it, most people would think this would be it because it's hidden with the buried in the tomb. But no, 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 it's in this kind of thing. And we press it and find it all out. So I like that that, that kind of works in the logic of, of Schmidt. And he pulls out this box, he opens it, he's bathed in this blue light. And am I correct that this is, in fact, the first appearance of an inf Infinity Stone in the MCU? Yeah, well, a first a first real appearance. Like yeah. we see in the background of Thor, the first Thor, you see the mm. ga you see the the Infinity Gauntlet. But we find out in Thor Ragnarok that that was a fake. Ah, ah. Um, I love this line, by the way. There's lightning going on behind, and as he's looking at this blue light, he says. <laughs> what trinkets is he digging for? Ooh. An ark? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> An ark? <laughs> you have never seen this, have you? It's not for the eyes of ordinary men. Exactly. Closes it, the light goes out. Fool! You cannot control the power you hold. You will burn! I already have. And as he's doing that, he's kind of playing with his face a little bit. It's a great wink to the comic book fans that exactly moment, him adjusting the skin for people who are like my girlfriend watched it, didn't, you know, didn't think anything of it. But, you know, it's later when you see the skin reveal or whatever. But like, yeah, it's so great. And the fact that they hold out on showing his face for the first hour of the movie. Yeah, uh, you do not see the Red Skull face necessarily. Uh, you get the inferences, but it isn't until much, much later. So it's just kind of interesting the way they're playing him out. Even like you said, the introduction of him, he's all black, you know, in, in backlit. So you don't really see his face. 
to later. So they're doing a great job just keeping the mystery running through the opening of this movie. Yeah, you don't see, like you see the reveal of Red Skull, uh, as John said about an hour in, and it's after that that you get the first reveal of Cap in his proper proper uniform. Right, 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 right. The last thing he does, of course, is shoot the old guy, uh, and we see blood splattered on that Hydra symbol. <laughs> really, really thick, really red blood. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want you to miss it. <laughs> um, and now we cut to New York and we're hearing these uh, names being read off and we're going by these guys in a recruitment office. They're all shirts off. And there's this one guy reading a newspaper that has war news. Boy, a lot of guys getting killed over there. Rogers, Stephen. And he lowers the paper and there is skinny Steve Rogers. Kind of makes you think twice about enlisting, huh? Nope. Oh. Such a great, such a great introduction to, to, to his character. Um, you know what this, this movie came out in 2011. So what it's, it's 12 years, almost 13 years old now. Um, you know, special effects are a thing that constantly just get better. Mm. So watching it, like it, does it look a little weird with our eyes now? Yeah. But at the time, it was just so, cause you know, we all knew what Chris Evans looked like. The dude is huge, but watching his sort of shrunken face on this tiny little body. It was just for a, for a little guy myself, it was very inspiring. <laughs> yeah. I remember that being the, the narrative after the movie came out and people's reactions was how well the CGI made you believe that he was looking like this and it didn't look weird. It didn't look awkward. Yeah. Now we can look back and it does look a little off. Certainly I felt that way too. Watching it this time, Shannon, but like overall, at the time, people were going crazy about it. There were articles about it that were so positive about how they were able to do that for the first half of the or first part of the movie. And Steve, I want to ask another question, and Shanna too, if you wanted to chime in on this. The shots of New York are not what you would normally see in the shots of New York. Um, it looks a little more green screeny or kind of maybe slightly futuristic in even though it's 1940s it has a different vibe there isn't the kind of i don't sense that kind of you know brick a sepia tone kind of approach until later the initial shot almost seems to tease to you that this is going to be a futuristic story and so i, I was just surprised by that watching it this time around had that sky captain world of tomorrow vibe to it. yeah it looks like the future that didn't happen yeah, um, yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's our universe just with a slight a slight turn of the dial. And to me, everything, especially those big wide shots, they tend to look very Norman Rockwell. And yes. I think that I think that was deliberate, uh, especially in, you know, they couldn't have known this at the time, but knowing where Cap's journey was going to go in in the MCU, that you start in this very kind of picturesque black and white world and the late the, you know, the longer he lives, the more gray it becomes. I, I think it's a great observation. I even just in that first wide shot, it's sparklier. Yes, you know what yes, I mean? Right. It's, yeah. It has a shine to it that New York didn't have. But I think that's it's just what Shannon said. It's this creating this idealized mm -hmm. America of the past, you know, which has a little bit of future in it, which we're going to see later on. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about Skinny Steve <laughs> because I think that. They, uh, yes, do I, I think we've passed the uncanny valley at this movie, mm. which is that I don't look at skinny Steve and go, oh, that's wrong. It's not right. Uh, it looks weird. It doesn't look perfect. And it, they could do it better today, but it looks really good, I think. Yeah. I mean, they use three different ways to create skinny Steve. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had, they had the body double whose name is uh, an English actor named Leander Dini. And what they would do is put green dots on his face and then they would replace his face with Chris Evans. And then they would also um, digitally shrink down Chris Evans as well for certain shots, depending on what, depending on what the needs of that particular shot were. Like for instance, when he comes in to the, uh, the, the testing facility where he gets the, the, the serum, that was a Leander Dini shot because for whatever reason, as they approached the camera, like they needed, they needed his frame. Like it wasn't going to look right to shrink him down. I want to say in the recruitment office, that's a shrunk down Chris Evans, but I might be wrong. So the normal way you do effect shot like this is you have a meeting with the effects team and they go, this is how we're going to do it. And then you talk to the production team and go, we need you to shoot exactly this. And this is how our effect is going to fit into that. That's not how this is done. What they did here is they went, 
we don't know how we're going to do it. So we're going to shoot it every possible way. <laughs> so frequently they would shoot a pass with the body double with green dots on his face. They would shoot a pass where Chris Evans did the whole scene with the other actors. And then for eyeline, because you need to look like you're looking at a short guy, the, the um, actors would be looking who are playing with Chris. They would be looking at his chin mm -hmm. and he would be looking at the top of their head so that the eyeline was correct. And so sometimes they would just shrink that body. Sometimes they would have, Chris Evans do the whole scene in front of a green screen so they could put the 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 uh, backgrounds of the other actors in or out. Sometimes yeah. they shot the whole camera move with no people in it. That's called an empty plate. So they could add the green screen Chris to it. And sometimes they shot all the actors without Chris. And so it's like, and then they handed all of this stuff to the effects team who used a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And every single one of these was done in a slightly different way. And frequently it's a combo. It's the, it's Chris's head who really acted it. It's the body double from take three. It's the other actors from take six. It's the, they use the plate at this moment. I mean, like it's nuts how they did this. Hmm. Um, and of course the goal is we want as much Chris Evans as we can possibly have in his performance. And I think they really succeed in that. Yeah. Oh, and, and one other thing they did, by the way, is they also reshaped his face. So his jaw is thinner. Yeah. His cheekbones are smaller. And this is done by a company called uh, uh, Lola, which specializes, they say their specialty is digital plastic surgery. <laughs> I don't know, John, when we do our live shows, I could, I kind of could have them come in. Bro, I'd like to give them my Instagram and go through every picture and uh, digitally alter me so I lose a few pounds there. Yeah, I'm down. Um, I don't know what you guys are talking about. You're both incredibly handsome. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> um. So he gets called in to as an exam, and I love the looks that the doctor gives to him right from the beginning. What'd your father die of? Mustard gas. He was in the 107th Infantry. I was hoping I could be assigned. Your mother? She was a nurse in a TB ward. Got hit, couldn't shake it. What I like about this is both of his parents sacrificed their lives to a greater good. Yeah, so there's a there's a uh, you know like people talk about what was that what was that film where they saw the different generation? Oh, Forrest Gump, right? With uh, Dan watching the different generations. Oh yeah, all dying in the different <laughs> wars. This is <laughs> this is kind of similar. I love that sequence, but this is kind of similar, right? Because you have the mom and the dad dying. And you know what struck me this time around? How everyone goes crazy. It was like I say. I want to say this because I don't get crazy. People get upset at me, but well, whatever. I don't care. Um, the, the, people go. Uh, people get all nuts about. Wanda, you know, oh, she suffered this trauma. She lost her brother. She lost her family and she lost her. Captain America has lost arguably just about as many people as Wanda has and didn't go that route. You know, lost his, her parents, his parents, loses Bucky for his for a, uh, what he thinks is forever, loses Peggy, loses 70 years of his life um, and goes through all this and you know, loses so many people. Uh, throughout loses Tony in him. So there are so many losses that he suffers. Uh, uh, Captain America does yet. You know, no one's like, he's the most traumatized person or he's lost the most in Marvel. If you go look at it, Captain America's lost the most amount of people. I think that were close to him. Even you could argue Dr. Erskine, who was like his second father figure, even for the limited amount of time we have him in the film, he's essentially the first guy that believes in him to get him into the service after all this time of being, you know, of trying to get in. So he suffered a lot of loss in his time, you know, and look, I get it. Different, different upbringings, certainly a war torn area that Wanda was raised in terrible situation there, but still you argue that, you know, Captain America's lost just as much, if not more people than Wanda. I think that we can say, I totally agree. And it's like, I can be sympathetic to Wanda having gone through the tragedy and go that caused these other things. Right. And admire cap for going through a lot of tragedy and not going that way. Yeah. yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like I, I, the, all of us respond differently to our traumas. Yes. You know? True. Uh, I, I would aspire to respond like cap does, but I, I don't know. Needless to say, <laughs> he gets a four F stamp. Yeah. <laughs> Which uh, during the marketing of this, when, the, when he gets the four F, in the marketing in the trailers, it says rejected because they did not think that audiences, they're like in a trailer, like they're not going to necessarily know what 4F means. So we really mm. have to hammer home that this is a rejection. That's interesting. That makes sense, actually. And we cut to a newsreel where Steve is watching and we're hearing all about the, the war effort, about volunteers going off to Europe, bodies coming back. And in the theater, we hear a guy start to heckle the newsreel. Play the movie already. 
Who knew that even back in the 40s there would be assholes talking in movie theaters? They start the cartoon! Hey, you want to shut up? And we see this big guy turn around, and then we have a hard cut to Steve getting punched. <laughs> <laughs> Which, the, the casting of this guy... He really looks like Gilmore Hodge that, he, that yeah. Steve ends up training with later. But you, you you get Steve just he keeps getting back up. Like he he gets yeah. hit, he gets punched, he falls, he keeps getting back up. At one point he grabs the top of a trash can. He has a trash can lid that we, you know, we get the first sense of him holding a shield. Yeah. And we get the classic line, which again, we were pretty sure it was gonna be used throughout the movie. Who knew it was gonna be used all the way to even movies today. You just don't know when to give up, do you? I'm gonna do this all day. Well, and I think that is the key to Steve Rogers. I mean, it's, you know, this, I could do this all day. The guy, no matter what the consequences, who isn't gonna quit, that's why we love Captain America. And you're absolutely right. And the, sh and the film does such a great job of laying that groundwork uh, in moments that feel organic, like you, they could happen. Like you could totally believe these moments could happen, right? You see the interactions that he has um, uh, with uh, with the doctor there. You know, he, he wanted to be a part of it with the exchange with that guy going, nope, I, I want to sign up, right? And him pushing the doctor, can't you do anything? Um, and him looking at the list of physical ailments that poor Steve is suffering through. And then Steve there watching the reels or whatever, because he's probably not going there for the movie. He's going there for the reels, I would imagine. I wouldn't be surprised if Steve Rogers leaves after the reels are done. Because mm. he's kind of living vicariously through uh, seeing uh, seeing uh, people possibly going to war and all of that and what they're experiencing in that theater of Europe, so I could absolutely believe that. So this guy, as someone who's gotten into a number of scraps, verbal scraps in a movie theater, I get it <laughs> when someone talks in the wrong moment or yells at the screen or whatever. I get calling that person out. I mean, I might have done a better job in that situation, Steve, but who knows? But it's a great way to introduce him of him going up against the bully, him going. And again, as you said, Shannon, it teases the shield, but it also teases Steve going up against someone who might be uh, stronger and quicker and more experienced than him in um, in uh, the Red Skull. You know, he's had the super serum for longer, so he's had more time to work on his skills. So kind of getting a little groundwork that this guy, no matter what the odds are, he's still going to stay in the fight until the last moment. And when he tightens that shield in Endgame against Thanos, that is a callback to that moment, to, the, to this moment that we just saw here with him picking up the shield to go against the bigger guy. Hey, pick on somebody your own size. Dodges the first punch and basically takes the guy out. Punches the guy in the face and then follows it with a kick to the ass, it, which is the most <laughs> the, the, really taking someone down a peg. If, if you've been sucker, if you've been punched in the face and then you get a kick to the rear. And this, of course, is Bucky Barnes. So when I first discovered Captain America, Bucky Barnes was like Robin. It was this kid. Yeah. Uh, by the way, the name Bucky Barnes is the star basketball player from Joe Simon's high school. Oh, really? Shit. That is wow. where the name comes from. That's fun. Yeah, I know they were talking about that. Like, obviously, Bucky is important to the mythology of Captain America. But, you know, when you're translating things for the screen, like you can't have a child running around the fields of World War Two. So <laughs> to basically age him up and make him not just his best friend, but basically he's sort of the alpha in yeah. that relationship. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a great choice. And having my Captain America knowledge really ended in the nineties. So I didn't, I didn't know anything about the winter soldier or any of that stuff. So I had no idea that Bucky Barnes was going to be this thing mm. that became really important later on. Sometimes I think you like getting punched. I had him on the ropes. <laughs> <laughs> I know you did. <laughs> yeah. And immediately the, the relationship is so clear, so fast. How many times is this? Oh, you're from Paramus now. You know it's illegal to lie on the enlistment form. And, and, and by the way, Bucky Barnes is in the 107th, which is what Steve Rogers, it's the unit he wanted to be in. Mm -hmm. And he's shipping out tomorrow. Come on, man. My last night. Gotta get you cleaned up. Why? Where are we going? The future. And we see on the newspaper the World Exposition, and we dissolve to the World Exposition. And this is uh, to the point, John, both you and Shannon were making is... This is like a futuristic version of the past. And, and this is why Joe Johnson was the right choice. Just, yeah. just those little touches are someone who lives in this wheelhouse, someone who sees the world in this way, which is why it was such a perfect choice. It has the Rocketeer vibes all over this thing. 
Yeah, even the shots of the Stark Expo, um, it looks like newsreel footage from the future that didn't happen come to life. Yeah, It ends up that Bucky has arranged for a double date. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Who hasn't been on one of these double dates? Bucky really gets, gets a check in the negative column here that the girl he tries to set Steve up with is just an utter asshole. <laughs> Well, it doesn't seem like Steve is all that comfortable. His his experience level with women is low, it seems. Yeah, and I feel like Bucky might have talked Steve up a little bit, but oh, yeah. to get her to agree with it. So, I mean, Bucky's is there's uh, a lot of strikes here for Bucky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that girl was pissed. These are not your Bumble pictures. These are not your Tinder pictures. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's that kind of situation. <laughs> now I'm just picturing uh Steve Rogers his the picture is is the built bulked up Captain America one yeah. but he's actually still skinny Steve <laughs> <laughs> but uh we're on this date now we're walking through this pavilion of all this high tech stuff including the original human torch is there which is the android from the 40s so, that's so great Ladies, this is this is great. Great. and we get Dominic Cooper who if you're trying to find you know a father for Tony Stark. I mean, you know, we had met Roger Slattery already, who played Howard Stark towards the end of his life in Iron Man 2. Casting Dominic Cooper, like, I think he is such a spectacular actor who's been criminally underused. I mean, he's the type of guy, I think he probably would have been a little too long in the tooth at the time, but when they were talking about casting a young Han Solo, I'm like, man, Dominic Cooper. Ooh. Dominic Cooper would have been a great, like, mm. does he look like Harrison Ford? Not at all. But he has... He has that swagger. He has yeah. that confidence. And just watching him roll out, I mean, you know, kind of based off of Howard Hughes, um, he, 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 he just he just uh, just bleeds cool all over the place. Well, and he's such a 40s character. You know what I mean? Like, it feels like that era of sort of an idealized 40s character. And also, I don't know if it made you think of this, John, but all I was thinking is in this scene is Tucker, a man in his dream. Absolutely. 100%. 100%. Yes. And he's doing this demonstration of a flying car and it actually does lift off the ground and then it sparks and crashes. <laughs> it, it, listen, this is a, this is a, this is um, a quick moment, but it's such a great character moment. The fact that he knows the name of all the girls that just speaks volumes about Howard Stark. Yep. Right? Thanks Amanda or whatever he says. So, you know, he's probably, you know, you know, he probably picked them all specifically had maybe even went out with a few of them or messed around with a few of them, but that's such a perfect moment to give you the idea that this guy is, you know, who he is. It's funny you say that because the other thing that it made me think of is the Charles Foster Kane song uh, at the party in Citizen Kane. Yeah. As this is all happening, Steve sees the classic Uncle Sam, I want you poster. And while Bucky wants to go off with the girls, Steve heads over to the recruitment center. And we have this moment that is visually just such a perfect storytelling moment, which is there's this thing where there's these soldiers in uniform and in the face of one is a mirror. So you could step on this platform and see your face as a soldier in uniform. We see a big guy go up and do it. And then Steve Rogers steps up and his head doesn't measure up. Oh, great moment. It's per. It's a perfect storytelling moment. You really gonna do this again? Well, it's a fair. I'm gonna try my luck. As who? Steve from Ohio? They'll catch you. Worse, they'll actually take you. Oh, and see, and that's where, like, as you as you mentioned already, Steve, we've seen that the relationship between these two, like, it is rock solid. Yeah. But that moment that Bucky says that worse they'll take you. Bucky doesn't want anything to happen to his friend, and he knows, like, if Steve gets taken to war in this state, he's a goner. And, and also the back and forth here is really revealing because he calls him out as good friends do. He calls him out, Bucky does, because he says, Bucky, come on. There are men laying down their lives. I got no right to do any less than them. That's what you don't understand. This isn't about me. Right. Because you got nothing to prove. And it's just like it kind of takes that moment. You know, when you're watching a movie for our show, I pay attention to so much more that like I kind of just accept and enjoy and watch when I watch a movie. But something like this and these little exchanges that you have, these back and forth, as you both have said, their relationship works. The reason it works is because you kind of unconsciously see these back and forths that remind you of relationships you have in your own life with your own friends. And so there's an authenticity to that. And you can absolutely skip that moment, but that moment is big that he says to him, no, no, this is about you too. So as heroic as you think you are, you are still trying to prove something to yourself and, and just want you to be aware of that, you know? And do you think that's true? Yes. A hundred percent. Absolutely. I, Me you know, too. I, and I don't think it's a negative to be honest with you, because 
a lot of people do things to prove something to themselves. And the indirect result is we're somehow we're, it advances our society or it helps our society or it saves our country or whatever. And, and I'm all, I'm all for it. I think one of the big mistakes we make about humans is go like, you have one motivation and that's why you're doing it. Yeah. It's like, does Steve care about his country? Does he believe in self-sacrifice? Does all that? Absolutely. All that is true. Does he also have something to prove? Absolutely. No greater motivator, in my opinion. And while this is happening, we see Abraham Erskine, Stanley Tucci, standing behind. And I'm going to say this right now. There's all sorts of great things in this movie. To me, the key is Stanley Tucci. Oh, yeah. He's so great in this film. He's like, the in this weird way, the glue that pulls it all together for me. It's also, by the way, why the first half of the film works much better for me than the second half of the film. How dare you? <laughs> um, I, I can't disagree with you there, Steve. How I dare you both? <laughs> the setup for this movie is spectacular. Yeah. And the last half, the second half, is really good. It's good, yeah. Totally good. And even though they're having this kind of argument, their goodbye is really great. Oh, it's really sweet. Don't do anything stupid until I get back. How can I? Taking all the stupid with you. Yeah, they 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 hug each other while call calling them each other calling each other punk and jerk. Which I didn't know if men did in the 1940s, but it's a nice kind of anachronistic yeah. thing to see. Well, hey, by the way, the hug, talk about hard things to make st- skinny Steve work. <laughs> the hug is hard. That was Why tough. Bet. Bet. Don't win the war till I get there. <laughs> but the last thing Bucky does is give him a salute. Yeah. Out yeah. Of respect. That's something. Now we're in another exam room. Is there a problem? Just wait here. And there's a sign that says it's illegal to falsify enlistment information. <laughs> Which is and, something that Bucky tells him before. Yep. He's yes. like, you know, this is illegal. And, you know, great acting moment from Chris Evans. I mean, obviously the, the effects really sold the illusion of Skinny Steve, but also it was Chris Evans acting. Yeah. I mean, that moment where he looks, you know, we get that take of him looking at the sign and the oh shit moment. I might be caught. Mm -hmm. And and by the way, there is an arc to uh, Chris Evans's body in the course of the film, because you want to hit the peak at the moment that you're going to be shirtless. And so there are times in the film where he's way more ripped than he is in other times. Just because of scheduling, at the time they shot this scene, he was at peak ripness. He is huge (laughs) right now playing this scene. And I love the next moment is just as he's starting to get nervous, there's an MP. Yeah, <laughs> I've been through this experience, and it's not it's it's, it's an unsettling one. I, I bet, I bet it's unsettling. Um, and then in walks Erskine, Stanley Tucci. So, you want to go overseas, kill some Nazis? Excuse me, Doctor Abraham Erskine. I represent the Strategic Scientific Reserve. Steve Rogers. Where are you from? Queens. <laughs> and then he asked, where are you from, Mr. Rogers? And it's clear that he knows he's been applying to multiple places. Yeah, yeah. Because he said, oh, that's the wrong file or whatever. And, and he says, no, no, I just need to know where you're from because it's, I don't care about any of that stuff. And then he says, he says, Brooklyn. But you didn't answer my question. Do you want to kill Nazis? Yeah, you get a great Stanley Tucci moment when Steve asks, is this a test? Is this a test? Yes. I don't want to kill anyone. I don't like bullies. I don't care where they're from. Another, yet another great window into this guy's heart and what he, why he wants to do the things that he's doing. Well, there are already so many big men fighting this war. Maybe what we need now is a little guy. Huh? Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> and there's just a great reaction from Chris Evans. And this is, it's the heart of the film. Mm-hmm. You know, just this idea like, oh, wait, I might actually have a chance. I can offer you a chance. Only a chance. I'll take it. Good. So where is the little guy from? Actually. Brooklyn. Congratulations, soldier. We look down at that folder, and instead of a 4F, there is a 1A. We cut to our bad guys' snowy hideout in the mountains. <laughs> um, every, every bad guy has one. Yeah. And we are going to meet Armin Zola, Dr. Zola, played by Toby Jones. Which, what a cool way to introduce that character. 
with a magnified image of his face on a screen. Because for comic book readers, you know that Arnim Zola, uh, eventually his, his consciousness gets placed in a, giant, in a giant body and you see his tiny little face on a screen in his chest. <laughs> and we're setting up for some kind of scientific experiment. We don't know if the equipment is going to stand up to the energy from this cube. By the way, there's so much back and forth that makes very little sense in all of this. Where, like, first, <laughs> Schmidt is asking, are you sure your things can handle it? And he goes, I don't know if it can handle it. And then we turn it on. We go to 20, 40, 60 percent, stabilize at 70 percent. And now the guy who a minute before was going, can your machines handle this? And we hear, I don't know if he can handle it, goes, I have not come all this way for safety, doctor. And he turns it up to full. <laughs> and all sorts of lightning explosions and sparks go around. This will change the war. And so, love. this will change the world. So, your basic bad guy scene, I think. Yeah, and not, not a lot of depth yeah. <laughs> to these guys. Uh, Steve and a bunch of recruits are all lined up, and we get to meet Agent Carter, Haley Atwell. Oh, be still my beating heart, my goodness. She's all, you know, I know I said that Stanley Tucci, I think, is the glue. She's so good in this movie. She's excellent. And really, this was sort of her introduction to American audiences. And like, who knew? Like, obviously, she's she was wonderful in this movie. Who knew that over 10 years later, (laughs) she was still going to be playing this character who was only supposed to be in one movie? Yeah. That shows you the power of her performance, for sure. Yep. Totally. A hundred percent. And she walks up and immediately... One of the recruits, the big guy, Gilmore Hodges, is giving her some crap. <laughs> Must be the accent, Queen Victoria. Thought I was signing up for the U.S. Army. She has him step forward. Mm, you get a rasa? Because I got a few moves I know you'll like. And she punches him in the face and knocks him down. <laughs> it's a good intro. Great intro followed by another great intro. I don't know. I have very mixed feelings about Tommy Lee Jones. Oh, this is going to be fun. Okay. Oh, he's all oh, fire. I away. love Tommy Lee Jones. Okay. I just don't feel like his character quite tracks for me. Okay. General Patton has said that wars are fought with weapons, but they are won by men. We are going to win this war because we have the best men. And at that moment, he sees Steve. <laughs> <laughs> As we kind of have a montage of the training, we hear stuff about the Strategic Science Reserve. But every army starts with one man. Roger. At the end of this week, we will choose that man. How's he doing on these obstacle courses and training exercises? He's not quitting. He's not quitting. Yeah, but he's not doing well either, though. <laughs> so, I mean, let's be real. You know, I mean, like he was him falling off the rope uh, uh, ladder there. Him and I, I know what's his face kind of kicks out the thing to put him in the, the barbed wire. But Shannon's right. He's not quitting, but he's not doing well. So um, th- those things can hold back a whole uh, platoon. So uh, there is legitimate concern, I think, on Tommy Lee Jones' side about this situation. Absolutely. Totally. Um, they're running. <laughs> Steve is way, way behind. Peggy is watching. They stop at this flagpole. That flag means we're only at the halfway point. First man to bring it to me gets a ride back with Agent Carter. And the mob of recruits all try to climb this flagpole. They all fall down. Nobody's got that flag in 17 years. Steve Rogers walks up, <laughs> grabs the peg that supports the flagpole. It falls down, and he grabs the flag. <laughs> I've never seen a flagpole designed like this, <laughs> but I'm sure glad that's the one they use at that base. <laughs> so it's such a Alexander cutting the Gordian knot bit of strategy. Mm. Like, uh, and I love his smile as he jumps in the Jeep with Peggy. Like, he isn't throwing it in their face. He, nope. he even gives the sergeant the cap, uh, the uh, uh, drill sergeant the uh, flag. And gets it, and he isn't doing it so he can ride with Peggy necessarily. He's just doing it because he it's logical. And of course, the other guys who are relying on muscle and not their brains are kind of perplexed by what he did. We cut to them doing push-ups, or everyone doing push-ups, and Steve attempting to do push-ups. That was rough. You're not really thinking about picking Rogers, are you? I wasn't just thinking about it. It's a clear choice. When you brought a 90-pound asthmatic onto my army base. 
I let it slide. I thought, what the hell? Maybe it'd be useful to you, like a gerbil. <laughs> Stick a needle in that kid's arm, it's gonna go right through him. Come on, go. <laughs> He's got the guy it should be is Hodges, which is the guy that was sort of picking on Agent Carter before. Hodge passed every test we gave him. He's big, he's fast, he obeys orders, he's a soldier. He's a bully. You don't win wars with niceness, doctor. You win wars with guts. And Phillips pulls out a grenade, tosses it right into the crowd, yells, Grenade! Everyone scatters except Steve Rogers, who throws himself on the grenade. Get away! Get back! And he's, I mean, in this moment, is he ready to die to save other people's lives? It looks like. 100%. Yeah. Now, now, John, in basic training, do they have crates of fake grenades? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the 1940s, because we're in the middle of a war, but no, not where I, where I was. But you were trained on grenades, on throwing grenades. That's actually a huge part of basic training. That in marksmanship, uh, you, you got to be successful in throwing grenades to certain locations, and you get judged on it. Um, sure. Yeah. So, in my understanding, yeah, throwing a grenade is really scary. Yeah, it is. And, you know, when you're grabbing, you're, you're hope they're dummies. So there's always that fear that goes through your mind because you have to go through the whole rigmarole as you would normally do it in war. So, um, and I want to quote, I want to go back to one real quick thing. The, what he says about uh, what Tommy Lee, what's his character's name again? Colonel Mr. Phillips. Okay. When Colonel Phillips says that thing about the needle going through, he's not wrong. Some yeah. of those needles are fucking <laughs> long. And I remember you get inoculated as soon as you go through basic training, the first weekend you're in basic training. You get inoculated, like eight different diseases, you get inoculated, those, and those needles get exponentially longer uh, as you go through the cycle of the factory, uh, getting getting uh, pricked there. So so here's my what I feel about Colonel Phillips. Yeah, let's get to this. Is that... <laughs> <laughs> is that Cheer from... Pacifist. This, let's hear it. Let's hear it. I totally understand why he's anti-Steve Rogers at the mm -hmm. beginning. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why this moment he doesn't acknowledge that Steve Rogers is a truly brave person. You mean when he walks away and makes that comment, he's still skinny. Yeah. That, have, <laughs> I think he is acknowledging. He's acknowledging. His he bravery. Is. He, he's, he's like, yes. anti, he's anti Steve Rogers until he rescues the guys and brings them back. No, no, I, I, no, I disagree there. I don't think he's anti Steve Rogers. Like they don't know. They've not done, used this serum on an American before. They don't sure. know exactly what it's going to do. So you kind of want to hedge your bets and have the best the best physical specimen possible. The fact that you're you've got this tiny, skinny, uh, uh, health uh, health challenged individual that doesn't seem like the best um, place to to try this out on. So, but I mean, he does acknowledge that he's brave the moment that he says, "Well, he's still skin well, he's still skinny." When right. we get to the fact that he does rescue all those guys things are introduced that are not necessarily in Steve's control. Like, like uh, Chester Phillips as a military man knows that thinks that um, in his experience, one individual, even if you are a super soldier, you cannot change the war. And that's where he's ultimately proven wrong. Yeah. And so him being anti Steve, you need that. You got to have someone who's doubting because Peggy is totally on Steve's side. Er Erskine is totally on Steve's side. So just narratively, you need to have somebody who's still doubting Steve because that's the groundwork that you've laid from the beginning of the movie that nobody believes in him. So you got to still have that element in a way and that is from someone who is in power, not that bully idiot who got found out with the grenade situation. You still have to have someone who's kind of doubting him so the audience is still cheering for him and having that underdog mentality for him until he comes out of the uh, of the chamber with the serum. Uh, but yes, Shannon's right. Uh, when he walks away and says, well, at least in my, I agree with Shannon rather, when, she, when he walks away and says, uh, you know, he's still skinny. That's his way of, of giving in on all the other points, but the skinny point, he's still right on. So that's still him holding on to it. And he's a hardened army soldier. He says, he literally quotes Patton in his first statement. Right. So that lets you know the kind of guy he is, that he's going to be hard to win over. But once you win him over, he's there's going to be no more loyal person in your camp than him. So I totally agree that we need to have that antagonist. We need to have that anti-Steve person. And I agree that there's grudging uh, respect here. It's just sort of the progression doesn't quite ring perfectly to me. Okay. Like for the first half of the movie, Phillips is more of a jerk, like not a great guy, rather than a great guy that needs convincing. I see. I don't think he is. I don't see him as a jerk as all. Yeah. At all. I know these guys in the military. The they're, they're that way. So you are trained to be 
strong in moments of war. They're that way because they cannot let you see their vulnerability. But when they do, it's well earned. But they have to be this way because they're training people. I well, mean, I'm fine with him being tough as a trainer. Okay. It seems like you're not because you're saying he's a dick. He's being tough. No, yeah. I'm saying that from this point forward, yeah. he should have respect for Steve Rogers, well, which he doesn't really show. Well, no, what? he might he might respect his courage, but he would still be even you can be as brave as you want, but on the battlefield, if you're not an asset to any sort of Absolutely. offensive I agree. You're, let, you're, let, you're let's, a detriment. Let's, let's move on because we'll get because it's really after he becomes a super soldier <laughs> and then later on in Europe, he continues to disrespect Steve Rogers. Um <laughs> Okay, moving on. <laughs> um, the next scene is fantastic. Yeah. We're in the barracks. Steve is alone. Erskine comes in. Can't sleep? Get the jitters, I guess. <laughs> Me too. It's so funny because right now I've been watching the Stanley Tucci Searches for Italy thing on CNN, which is just watching this very charming man go around and eat delicious pasta and drink glasses of wine. <laughs> it's like you can't I can't yeah. love Stanley Tucci more yeah. than watching it. But see, his performance in this scene is so gentle. Can I ask you a question? Just one. Why me? I suppose that is the only question that matters. This is why you cast a guy like this. Yeah, so you can have those moments and it may create a very fast connection with Chris Evans. Like he creates a very fast father son dynamic here, a mentor mentee dynamic. And you can tell that he's a gentle man. He's a caring man. He tells the story, uh, uh, you know, during these interactions about uh, Schmidt and about everything that went on with the soul with the serum. Um, but I always find it quizzical this scene because Steve wanted to be in this position and he feels he deserves it. Like he feels like he, you know, he's got a lot of heart and he's got a lot to give. So I, why is he questioning uh, Erskine about why me? Like, it just seems odd to me that he would do that considering he's been so desperate to prove that he does belong, that he is just as good as any other soldier. Why would he ask him why me? It seems a bit incongruent for me this moment, but at least a great exchange for sure. I just don't hundred percent believe Steve would be like, well, why me? You know? I mean, for me, if you've been rejected over and over and over and over again, your entire life, and everyone telling you you're weak, you're no, you know, you you can't compete. All this, someone picks you for the team. All of a sudden, I can see having that reaction. But you yeah. believe you 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 should have been picked for the team the whole time. That's the question. That he isn't a guy who's like he isn't Michael Sarah in Arrested Development walking away all the time with the head down because he right. knows he's a loser. He actually <laughs> believes he's a winner. It's just no one wants to give him a shot to show that. So I think yeah. there's the difference. So to it's, me, it it's seems you know, it's that moment of being called up to the big leagues. Like you think you think you're ready, but until you're mm. actually in that position, that's when self doubt can start to creep in. Especially because when he's picked, there's a lot, there's a good amount of time for him to reflect on everything that has come before this moment and be like, oh man, am I ready? Am I the guy? Yeah, I guess I would have liked to have seen that a little bit more because it just seemed to come out of the blue, that question. Because with Rocky, I get it. Because Rocky didn't want to be the world champion. You know, Rocky is like, when he has those questions near the end of the film before the fight, that's logical. But with, like, why'd you pick me? Why me? You know, but with this, uh, it just seems odd because he wanted to be in this position and, and took it. You know, so I don't know, but I hear your points. It just seemed odd to me. I'll say this, like, and, and I think maybe this this analogy will will ring a, a little clearer like i think i'm a pretty good actor mm -hmm. anytime i book a job and i'm in a trailer before i get called to set i think oh no this is the day <laughs> that, <laughs> right <laughs> i'm about to be found out and every, you know, daniel day lewis said that but every actor feels this way yeah but but i think that's the th i think that's the feeling for steve is mm -hmm. this is the first time he's ever been kind of grant been granted this this opportunity and so this is that this is the first time he gets to reflect on that self doubt. I guess I would have liked to have seen maybe a couple of scenes where he's failing at these things and he's really starting to question himself. I think it would have been that would have given a little more background to uh, understand why he's asking this question of Erskine. We see him fail, but we don't see Steve go. I can't do this, or I'm not. This is harder than I thought, or what am I gonna like? We don't see him question himself. And so if we'd seen maybe one or two of those moments, I think it would have added a little more weight to him asking this question of Earth. So just I opinion. think that's a great point. Yeah. I really, because, because, and it's the trade off between I can do this all day. The guy who is just never going to quit. Yeah. Yeah. Giving him a moment where he's trying to climb that, you know, the rope wall, you know, the wall and he falls and just giving him that one moment where he looks up and sees the other guys way ahead. Yeah. 
that that might that would have helped support like wait what am i doing i right. can't do this because there's no interactions with him and hodges no. except for him kicking the barbed wire there's no actual verbal interactions with hodges you know where hodges goes what are you doing here punk you don't deserve to be here blah 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 so it's just interesting erskine has an amazing line in the scene uh where he says so many people forget that the first country the nazis invaded was their own <laughs> great line that's a great line mm-hmm. that's familiar and then we hear what happened to him and that he was the scientist and he got brought on along with Schmidt because he could is developing this super soldier serum and he doesn't want to do it for them. He doesn't want to do it for Schmidt. Hitler uses his fantasies to inspire his followers. But for Schmidt, it is not fantasy. For him, it is real. So when he hears about my formula and what it can do, he cannot resist. I love the way they shoot these flashbacks. Because you don't see all the details. You see that something happened when he took that serum. We don't know what happened exactly. The serum was not ready. But more important, the men. The serum amplifies everything that is inside. So good becomes great. Bad becomes worse. Yeah. I actually wonder, like, how much did the serum change Steve Rogers' personality? I think it gave him the extra oomph he needed to validate his belief in himself and his belief in how the world should be and how he wants the world to work. Because don't forget, as as Tony as all the Tony Stark is, he has a strong belief of how the world should be. Cap is just as strong on the other side. He's no wallflower, Cap. And so he's got a perception of what he thinks the world and how it should operate. Um, and I think that's what the serum did. And of course, augmented all his natural uh, hero, heroic instincts, but also gave him that strength to back up the things that he's talking about. Right. Totally agree. It allowed him to be the person he thought he could be. This is why you were chosen. Because a strong man who has known power all his life may lose respect for that power. But a weak man knows the value of strength and knows compassion. I love that even Steve Rogers needs to have that person in his corner. Like you mentioned Rocky before. Yeah. yeah. Who's Rocky without Mickey? And when, when we hear, you know, Mickey loves you, like all of us need that at certain points in our life. That's a yeah. huge thing. Whatever happens tomorrow, you must promise me one thing, that you will stay who you are. Not a perfect soldier, but a good man. When he calls him a good man and he, kind of points at his heart. He touches his chest. Mm, That's yeah. such that, that moment lands so hard because you feel like, you know, you've had that moment with a teacher, with a coach, with yeah. a parent, like that moment where they're like, you know, you, you can do this. I want to say something real quick and maybe you'll cut this out, Steve, but um, at the most recent CinemaCon, I ran into my friend, Sean O'Connell who runs cinema blend. He pulled me aside and he said, I just wanted to let you know, man, I've been watching all your stuff for the last year and I'm so happy with how you're doing and keep going. You're doing good stuff. You're building something good. And when he said that to me, that meant so much to me because I am so in the pits on myself constantly with the stuff I do on the channel and, and our stuff. I'm always constantly in the pits of trying to do stuff and hoping it turns out right and wondering if people are going to watch and all this kind of shit. So when someone who's been doing it for a while and has a successful website that people turn to in the industry says to you, you're doing great work and means it, he's not bullshitting you or just giving you some compliment. He's He means it. He pulls you aside to tell you that. It means the world. And so – um, I kind of flash back to that moment when I was watching the scene this morning. Uh, and so, you know, but yeah, you can cut that out. I just wanted to share that. With nope. You. Nope. Not cut out. <laughs> not going to be cut out to the little guys. No, no, wait, wait, what I am doing. No, you have a procedure tomorrow. No fluids. Oh. All right. We'll drink it after. No, I don't have a procedure tomorrow. Drink it after. I took it now. <laughs> <laughs> Great character moments. Uh, great character moments. I great. wonder if Tucci had any influence on the back and forth and the writing of these of these scenes because they're so natural. It just feels like something he would naturally say or do. He, he, the, he he's such a fascinating person, you know. Mm-hmm. Having directed but, one really good movie, yeah, but big then night? not yeah, big night, but then not directed a lot. Let me, I, I have a comment for you guys, and I wonder what you think about this. And it may have been because I saw Pinocchio, the trailer this morning, did a reaction to it. Do you guys think? he is like Geppetto. And 
Captain America is is uh, Steve Rogers is going from you know like uh, a wooden puppet into a real boy. He's essentially becoming that thing he's always wanted to be from the beginning, which is a soldier but also a hero. And I wonder if him having that kind of older with the glasses, there's this kind of Geppetto Pinocchio situation because Geppetto was also giving Pinocchio lessons on how to be a real boy uh, throughout the movie. So it just kind of struck me. And I wonder if I'm off base on that. No, so, you're not, you're not going to believe this, but about when we started talking about this section, I legit had the same thought. <laughs> well, <really? laughs> that, that, that Stanley Tucci very much has a Geppetto vibe here oh. and giving that serum to Steve turns him into the real boy. Yeah. So here's my thought process. When you first said Geppetto, I went, no, come on. <laughs> and literally in the next second, I went, yes, <laughs> that is a hundred percent. Exactly. Right. That's great. Right. Um, and the accent doesn't hurt either. Yeah, true. Very good point. We're back at the, at the evil lab. And I love that we see for just a few frames the red skull who's getting his portrait done mm -hmm. before he switches the lights off. It's like the, the t you just can almost barely see that there's something weird there, but it's not long enough to see what it was. I understand you found him. See for yourself. Toby Jones's Arnim Zola is such a fascinating character because he's a villain. Like he's, he, he's a bad yeah. guy. Um, but you can see like his motivation be like, well, why are you going after him? Like what, like, of course this isn't going to work. It's not, you know, you know he's not going to succeed dot, dot, dot. Again, I mean, <laughs> trying like, like implying that, you know, Johann Schmidt's taking the serum didn't work because it turned him into this sort of grotesque individual. But, you know, it, it's really interesting to kind of find his to find his point of view on this because he is a bad guy. But why doesn't he feel the need to go after Erskine? Zola is a really interesting character. I think he is mostly amoral. I think he just wants to build his things interesting but also you can tell he's one of those guys that yeah you're right steve he is going to say what he needs to say because the overall accomplishment he's not caught up in the ego or the submissive dominant situation to him it's more about who do i need to be with so that i can finish my research or finish my projects yeah. or create the things i i want to create here so i'm sure i've mentioned many times on the cinephiles my absolute love for tom lair who's the great comedic singer from the 60s who did all sorts of interesting political songs one of his songs that makes me think of zola is about Werner von braun and one of the lines in it is he says once the rockets are up who cares where they come down that's not my department says Werner von braun <laughs> <laughs> Tom Lehrer is the best. <laughs> I was also going to point out the uh, the actor who's playing the painter. Oh. <laughs> I mean, the moment that Schmidt turns the light back on yeah. <laughs> as Toby Jones is exiting, you see the anguish on this poor painter's face being like, God, I don't want to do this, but yeah, I got to pay rent. I, I, well, or he's Jewish. And he's oh. like, because a lot of Nazis, right, used Jewish people to entertain them, to play music, to do all kinds of things. So I wouldn't be surprised if this artist was Jewish as well. Yeah, I don't know that this artist lives out the day once he's yeah. done with his painting. Uh, and the, the important piece of information we get here is that we found Erskine, we know about the super soldier serum, and there have been orders given to take care of it. Before we left this scene, I want to talk about this. The opera that is being played mm. here, I think, is really important. The Pizzola. It's uh, Wagner's Der Ring des Nibelungen. I apologize to any German people if I mispronounce that. What do you think? But Wagner was anti-Semitic. And so this is something that it's a big deal. Masterpiece. And this particular opera, I think, is about a ring or try, so trying to yeah. get some kind of power uh, and what it does to people when they get that power, right? And this is the same soundtrack or the same song that is playing at the end of Excalibur. Yep. When Mordred and uh, Arthur have that battle and he yanks the spear to himself to kill Mordred, you know? So this idea of these, of these things that you must possess, these objects that you possess, and once you possess them, what it call, what it changes within you and changes the other people who want to have those objects as well. So just a nice use here. Because normally you see opera and it's like, oh, it's stereotypical villain opera. That makes sense. But this one has a little more subtext to it that I think was very smart of Joe Johnston and the production people to use. 
Well, and there's a direct connection. I'm really glad you brought that up. There's a direct connection between the ring of the Nibelung, and I mm. did about the same pronunciation <laughs> that you did, uh, and the Lord of the Rings. Like right. that's acknowledged. Yes, there, there's definitely there. Right, right. We're driving through Brooklyn with Peggy. By the way, this is all in Manchester in England. Oh, there's really? a lot of redress. They had like one street that they felt they could use that they just redressed over and over and over again. And I love that as they're driving, he's pointing out all the spots <laughs> where he was beat up. <laughs> kids let me tell you something this is not something you want to do to impress a woman in the car is to tell no. her all the places that you got your ass kids kicked it is a really good thing did you have something against running away if you start running they'll never let you stop you stand up you push back you can't say no forever right great moment this is a, this is a great scene and you can see you get a sense of the man that steve is and that you know he's sitting with this you know very beautiful woman and he's completely focused on on what it is that he has to do and you notice peggy peggy watching him and him not watching her and but he, there is a moment where he says i guess i just don't know why you'd want to join the army if you were a beautiful dame or a beautiful a woman an agent not a dame you are beautiful but <laughs> First of all, I could picture all the little ellipses in how that line was written. <laughs> it's really good. And she says, You have no idea how to talk to a woman, do you? I think this is the longest conversation I've had with one. I agree, John. This is the great love story in the Marvel Universe. Yes. And it's what's so great about it is she loves him from the beginning. It yes. seems like. Yes. She loves him for who he is as a person first. And the muscles later are a nice extra a bonus <laughs> bonus. Right. But it's about who he is as a person first. Uh, and because she's, you imagine she's probably been hit on by a bunch of dudes who think that they've got the key to unlocking Peggy Carter, uh, but they don't. Peggy Carter's a completely, uh, um, she's a very, um, how could self-possessed woman. She's, mm -hmm. very, you know, she's gone through and she has that exchange with Steve where she says to him, you know, I know something about having doors slammed in your face and trying to prove yourself. I totally get it. So without putting too big of a highlight on it, you pick up the, uh, the exactly what she's referencing and what she's talking about, which I like, you know, they're having that connection here of similar and shared experiences. And you get to, you get to watch the reverse of their situation in what if when right. she's the one who right. gets the serum and he pilots, he pilots the, uh, the armor that, that Stark builds and that the feelings are still the same. Yeah. The other thing we get in the, this scene is the very first of the references to the dance. Mm. Yes. You must have danced. Well, that's going to woman to dance always seems so terrifying. In the past few years, just didn't seem to matter that much. Figured I'd wait. For what? Right partner. Ah, <laughs> beautiful. It really is. Part of what I love about their relationship is that deep down, they both know, you know? Yes. Yes. And maybe Steve, because he's inse more insecure at this moment, can't trust that he knows, but he kind of knows, I think. And there's a reason why this is the longest conversation he's ever had with a woman, because he kind of is maybe subconsciously sensing or feeling comfortable around her. Mm -hmm. And so he's able to maintain a conversation here with it, which is when the other women he probably wasn't able to. Well, and this is someone who he has a shared goal with. Like yes. they're not talking about, they're not talking, they're not discussing the dynamics of a relationship. They're both in the service of the greater good. We pull up in front of an antique store. We get in, there's this old woman who greets them and we get this little, <laughs> you know, code speak about an umbrella and stuff. And then she pushes a button and they go into the secret passage. We see that she has like a gun hidden below the desk. By the way, the original lab where the super soldier serum was done was mm -hmm. in the basement of Roz's delicatessen in the comics. And Roz is the name of Jack Kirby's wife. Oh, that's awesome. So we go down through the MPs into this hallway. And this is, I think, the shot that you mentioned before, Shannon, where he walks into the lab and the camera pushes in on him. And we see this space. And in the middle of the space is this Iron Maiden looking thing. Senator Brad, glad you can make it. Why exactly am I in Brooklyn? We needed access to the city's power grid. Of course, if you'd have given me the generators I requisitioned. A lot of people asking for funds, Colonel. Oh, this is Clem. Uh... Fred Clemson, State Department. I love that the center says, geez, someone get that kid a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and his companion is Richard Armitage, uh, who may not, uh, people may not know, the lead, the lead in The Hobbit. Uh, they're oh. Martin Freeman, the, the lead dwarf. 
Thorin Oakenshield. Yeah, Thorin Oakenshield, yeah. Wow. I would never have known. Yeah, unrecognized. We begin with a series of micro-injections into the subject's major muscle groups. The serum infusion will cause immediate cellular change. And then, to stimulate growth, the subject will be saturated with vital rays. Whatever those are. <laughs> it, it sounds like an ad that you would see in a comic book from like the late 60s. Yes. Vital Ray <laughs> will vitalize your system. Um, and they give Steve a shot, and this was in all the trailers. That wasn't so bad. That was penicillin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he starts getting these huge injections from these blue things hitting him in all these places. Now, Mr. Stark. And this big thing that Steve is in closes up, rotates up. All the camera work is super dramatic. And they attach these, you know, big steaming pipes to the thing. Stephen, can you hear me? It's probably too late to go to the bathroom, right? <laughs> we will proceed. And then we start cranking up the power and this thing lights up. And then at 50%, we hear screaming. 70. By the way, they pause at 70%, which is exactly where Zola paused at 70% before Schmidt made him go up to 100%. Everyone rushes to shut it down. Yeah, and I want to say Peggy's the first one to say yeah. to shut it down. No! Don't! I can do this! Turn it up to 100%, there's huge light, the equipment's exploding, the lights go down. And I love, by the way, that there's this window, this like faceplate, you know, in this device, and it's like, the last thing we saw was Steve not measuring up to where his face would fit in the soldier's face. Right. And now his face, his head, which was below the level of that thing, he's grown enough that he's up there. And it was interesting. One of the things they said was there's all sorts of movies where you see the transformation and that it's fun to see, you know, Banner turn into the Hulk or werewolf transformation. And what they said is this has to be the opposite. Mm -hmm. He goes in as one thing. He comes out as something else. We don't see the transformation at all. Yeah. The reveal of huge Steve Rogers, <laughs> I think it's one of the great moments in all the MCU. I, I would agree. And I love the fact that he comes out, he, you know, he's incredibly muscular. Um, huge. He, he, he's huge. He's gotten taller. Um, <laughs> his waist is the same size. <laughs> 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 the classic V shape. And there's this reaction that goes around the room that says he did it. He did it. He actually did it. And Peggy, <laughs> it's so, it's small and it's perfect uh, that she reaches out and she says, how do you feel? And then reaches out at just the tiniest touch. <laughs> <laughs> there are, throughout the movie, I think, I, I think I'm correct here. There are two moments where you see Peggy lose that stoic British stiff upper lip. Mm -hmm. And it's when he comes out of the machine and at the end. Yeah. Everyone's kind of celebrating and we think we're really going to win. And then the camera pushes to this guy, Fred Clemson. Uh, and suddenly we go, oh, shit. Yeah. And he pulls out a lighter and there's an explosion. And then he shoots Professor Erskine. <laughs> and Erskine sees him pull out the lighter, which yep. is great. Like everyone else is scrambling, like all like around. And then he sees him flip open the lighter. And he knows exactly what's coming. And I feel like he smiles at Erskine. Yeah. And Peggy chases after him. And Erskine looks up at Steve, who's, you know, having a big reaction. And it's what you said. He touches his heart. And there's this small nod. Um, <laughs> that poor old lady with the machine gun, she gets <laughs> taken out. And Peggy, she does the full Danny Glover from Lethal Weapon shot, mm. which just takes out the driver with a... Yeah, she doesn't st stretch her neck. <laughs> Kills the driver. The car explodes. He gets out. He steals a cab. Yeah. He's driving straight towards Peggy, and Steve knocks her out of the way. She was calibrating because she had taken two shots, and she was getting closer with each shot. So she's not wrong when Steve, like, knocks her out of the way. She says, I had him. She was. She's actually right. She probably might have gotten run over, too, but she absolutely had him. So... In this next action sequence, as Steve's going to chase down this car, they make a choice and they do it really well and it's all well executed and I totally would have made a different choice. Mm. Which is that their choice is that the moment that Steve has this new body, he pretty much knows how to use it. And, that, and I would have made the choice much more about him discovering what he can do and not doing it perfectly. 
And part of why I would have him not do it perfectly is it would give more motivation to Colonel Phillips rejecting him in the next moment. Yeah, this the ba- I've had this battle with Matt Nost on top 10 all the time because he feels the same way about it. And mm-hmm. I, I don't. I, I, I think it's it makes, a really good sequence. Oh, no, it is. And yeah. it's, the reason is because uh, he has already kind of had some kind of training there in the military. He's already felt like he can do the things that they're doing. Now that he's got the muscles, he can actually do these things. So the heart catches up to what the, the, the mind, the body is now caught up to what the mind thinks it can do. And remember, this is his area of Brooklyn. They show he's talking about where he, everything. So he knows where to go instinctively to try to catch it. And he does fly into a, a wedding shop or whatever through the window. So yep. he isn't a hundred percent accurate, but I get the criticism totally respected, but I like that. They, they still had a little bit of him figuring it out, but the fact that he's a hero and he comes to it quickly, I think is about adding that element of, or reinforcing the element that this guy is destined to yes. be this. And yeah, so it, he, it comes to it a lot more quickly than maybe someone else might have. It was the one piece from him that was missing. Yeah, right. And now he's complete. I think that is exactly the choice they made. I think they execute that choice really well. That's what I mean. It's like I would have, I would have had him bump his head on a door because he's used to being shorter. You know, oh, maybe. Yeah. Like yeah. I would have had a little bit more of that. Yeah. You know, or like the thing of, you know, you know how much strength it takes for you to lift up a thing. Well, for him, it took all his strength to lift up a thing. Yeah, maybe that moment when he jumps the fence, Steve, he stops for a second when he lands. He goes, oh, my God, I can do that. Exactly. No. So, yeah, that's I all I want. I totally or, get that. Totally. Or that he over jumps the fence because he doesn't know how high he can jump. Right, right. Those are the things. And I, same sequence, but just have more discovery. Yeah. You know, and more joy. Like, cause, like the first moment they start chasing after them and he's running, you know, 50 miles an hour or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um. By the way, they said that uh, Chris Evans' run was so unique that they couldn't double him, that they couldn't find a double that could run and have it match. So he does almost, he does a lot of his stunts and a lot of his running. They also said he was very fast. Um, yeah. But like, I would have loved the moment where he starts running and then he starts running faster and then he kind of looks around and goes, holy shit, look how fast that, you know, like has some of those experiences. I I want to see more of that. But that's not exactly what happens. He chases after them. He jumps over things. He runs over the tops of cars. As you said, he crashes through that uh, bridal store. Um, and then. And apologizes. Uh, and, the, and apologizes. Yes, and apologizes. <laughs> and by the way, this goes from Manchester, which is where the first street sets were, to like North Hollywood, where they filmed some of it. And then the pier stuff is in Liverpool. That's right, it is. So that's a lot of different pieces to fit together mm-hmm. for one for one chase sequence. Yeah. <laughs> it, and then we have our next shield moment, which is he's got the door of a car that he holds up and uses as a shield. Yeah. At this moment, the bad guy grabs a kid to use as a shield. Wait, don't, don't. Ah, no, don't. He throws the kid in the water. And this is a great moment. <laughs> <laughs> and then much like the super cool looking car design now we see the super cool looking sub design yeah the one person mini sub and again yeah and they do a great job of sort of period touches but also with this high-tech style and steve as the sub starts to pull away without hesitation dives into the water swims up to the sub punches through the dome and pulls the guy to the surface <laughs> So a pretty badass first showing for Captain America. Agreed. And we see as he throws this guy on the ground, a vial of blue liquid shatters, which is the last of the super soldiers. Here. Who the hell are you? The first of many. Cut off one head. And this guy bites down on his teeth and you already know what's going to happen. Two more shall take its place. And he foams at the mouth. Hail Hydra. And dies. And it's really at this moment that Steve first actually looks down at himself and realizes what's happened to him. Um, by the way, I like I said, I love Erskine. He's a great character. Dude, write down your research. <laughs> well, that was the only way to keep it safe and to keep it secure yeah. was to have it in his head. Yeah. That was the only mm. place someone couldn't go to break it out. Okay. I mean, it doesn't well, seem like a good plan to me. Look, hindsight is twenty twenty in this situation. Yeah. <laughs> Nineteen forty, Steve. You know. 
Look, 42. the Coca-Cola formula is is very secret, supposedly, mm-hmm. but apparently there are four people who know it, <laughs> not just one. Same thing with KFC. You're right about that. <laughs> Those damn 13 spices. Is, is it cumin? Which is it? What is the 13 spice? I've gotten, I've nailed 11 of them. <laughs> two more and I'll have it. <laughs> Zola! What are the last two spices, Zola? <laughs> Oh, uh, man, if only the Red Skull had put his his energies towards something constructive like that. Red Skull fried chicken. I like this. <laughs> I would totally buy it. RSFC. <laughs> Come and get some legs or some wings here. <laughs> so, the rests are the best. Yes. Right. Well, and I think that since A, we've actually Captain America, Steve Rogers has become Captain America, and B, I feel as if our conversation is <laughs> starting to degrade. Zola, <laughs> bring me some pockets! I want to see chicken! <laughs> no biscuits! <laughs> um, this would be a good time to end part one of, of our explanation of Captain America, the first Avenger. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, we'd love to hear what you think. Do you feel that Popeye's fried chicken is in fact superior to Kentucky fried chicken? (laughs) Would you rather have a Chick-fil-A sandwich? Maybe church is your thing. I'm actually a fan of Bojangles. Bojangles, delicious. Maybe this is something for you. (laughs) These are things that you need to figure out. And we'd love to hear your fried chicken comments on our Facebook page. Do a search for the Cinephiles. You can also discuss fried foods on Twitter at Cine underscore files. You can take pictures of fried foods and post them on Instagram at the Cinephiles podcast. You can contact me at SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. I will be eating fried chicken while I get ready for my next podcast recording for Enterprise Incidents for Star Trek. John, how would people find you? You can always find me at the Rook says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And yes, probably having some three piece uh, Popeye's chicken as I do prefer Popeye's chicken. Um, uh, and, uh, you can follow me uh, on Twitch, the Outlaw Nation, on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash John Roca says, and my other podcasts, which our guest is a part of, the Geek Buddies uh, the, uh, to- and the Top Ten. Um, and Shannon, where will you be eating fried chicken in the near future? Oh my gosh, I have a costume fitting in two days. I can't Damn. have fried food right now. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to have something fried and delicious, but no, right now I'm I'm having greens and grilled grilled meat. Um, but y- y- you know, you can you can uh, uh, tweet pictures at me showing me what you've had at Shannon underscore McClung or on Instagram at Shannon the Geek Buddy. And you, as John said, you can catch me every week on the Geek Buddies, actually twice a week right now because we're doing our reviews of Obi-Wan Kenobi on Disney Plus. And also, if you go to Netflix right now, you can see a little show that I got to write on called Strawberry Shortcake, Barry in the Big City. And I think that is it for this week. We will be back next week with another delicious fried food and the conclusion of Captain America, the first Avenger, right here on the Chicken Files, the Cinephiles. <laughs> <laughs>